Okay, let's get started. Uh, I wanna welcome everyone today. My name is Tom Hall. I'm the executive director of Montclair Film in Montclair, New Jersey. And I'm so pleased to welcome all of you to The Real James Bond, our conversation with Jim Wright and Marcy Eggers. Uh, today's program is a continuation of the partnership between Montclair Film and the Nature Conservancy of New Jersey. And we're so incredibly proud of the wide range of events on which we've been able to collaborate from story slams to screenings and now to our first uh, author conversation. So thank you all for partnering with us. We're so grateful to be your partners. Uh, despite the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, Montclair Film has continued to work hard to bring film education and storytelling to communities throughout New Jersey. Our virtual cinema, featuring new films from around the world each week remains open and our summer class registration for students in middle school through adult are now open as well. Please visit montclairfilm.org to find out more about our offerings and upcoming events. Uh, for today's conversation, please feel free to use the Q&A button below. Uh, you'll see it on the bottom uh, menu right in the center there on the, on the right hand side, not too far from the leave button. Don't click the leave button, stay with us. Um, but if you wanted to hit the Q&A button to ask any questions as they arise, sometimes they'll be answered in the middle of the uh, discussion and we will sort of put those aside. But if you have any pressing questions uh, toward the end, I'll be reading questions uh, to Jim and to Marcy uh, for their answers. So feel free to use that Q&A function to ask questions. I'll be monitoring the chat, but uh, the Q&A button is your best bet. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Barbara Brummer, the State Director of New Jersey at the Nature Conservancy to introduce today's guests. Barbara. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so honored today to introduce our two speakers. Uh, first is the author of The Real James Bond, and that's Jim Wright. Jim Wright uh, actually served as a trustee on our board for the New Jersey chapter of the Nature Conservancy for nine years. And he's currently a member of our Conservancy Council. Jim is a writer, a blogger, and he cares deeply about nature and natural history. And he has a special interest in birds and birding. And next is Marcy Eggers. Marcy is the deputy director of our Caribbean division at the Nature Conservancy. She's worked in international management positions for the Nature Conservancy for 18 years. Uh, she currently oversees the Caribbean division's conservation strategies around marine protection, climate adaptation, and coral restoration. The Caribbean Division implements conservation initiatives across 17 countries and territories. Uh, previously, she was the Conservancy's Regional Director for Marketing for Latin America. And she has an international MBA from the University of South Carolina's Moore School of Business and a BA in English from Emory University. So our two very esteemed uh, speakers today are looking forward to communicating with you and telling you a bit about this program. So I guess um, I'll move it over to them. Jim, if you want to uh, take Great. it from here. Absolutely. Thanks, thank you. So uh, just wanna thank everyone for being here today. Uh, should be a lot of fun. I'm gonna start just like a real James Bond movie with a film clip. And I know the James Bond movie, the 25th movie was supposed to open uh, like this weekend, but it's been moved back six months. So in the meantime, I'm providing you with a little James Bond fix. And of course, we'll talk about uh, some birds, the Caribbean and a lot more. So I'm going to uh, share my screen and let's get going. that song is not in your head the rest of the show the rest of the day. Uh, I picked this from uh, the opening of Goldfinger and I think this could be uh, James Bond's most brilliant disguise, 007's most brilliant disguise. 
and it has a wonderful burning theme. So see if you can pick up where 007 is hiding. I think that's where the term gullible came from. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we'll get on with the show here. Uh, a friend at the Nature Conservancy sent me this trivia genius uh, quiz a week or two ago. And uh, I was a little offended that it was a trivia genius, but the question is who was James Bond named after? A real life spy, the creator's neighbor, an ornithologist or a UK prime minister? Uh, I feared they're referring to 007 and not the James Bond I wrote the book about. Uh, a little disappointed that only 22% of the respondents knew the correct answer. And I hope by the end of the talk today, uh, you will know the answer as well. So a little about me. Like the real James Bond, uh, my name is James, but I go by Jim. I'm a Philly boy like the real James Bond, six foot two, Scottish, at least partly, and uh, I like birds. And uh, my middle name even begins with a B. So I guess I was meant to write this book. Uh, so I like to look at that Goldfinger opening and think of the cover of my book. Uh, here, the bird man here, the real James Bond is disguised as a bird as well. Uh, for you uh, bird fans out there, that is a Cuban green woodpecker. Uh, the book is by Shipper Publishing, and they did a beautiful job, I have to say. I'm very proud of this book. Uh, some great illustrations inside. Uh, one of my favorites is I came across a real James Bond stamp from the nation of Mali, and I was able to take a picture on the upper right-hand corner there of a Cuban toady in Cuba. And I should mention that uh, my background behind me, I'm not in Cuba at, the, at this moment, but that is a picture of the Bay of Pigs and the real James Bond happened to be there just before the invasion. So moving forward, uh, I love this quote from Julie, Julie Zikafus, who is an ornithologist and an author. And she writes, if the real James Bond does nothing more than convince readers that an ornithologist can be something other, other than proper, stodgy or dull, it will have done a great service. I hope the book does that. Uh, one of the problems is that the real James Bond himself was a little bit stodgy and dull in later life. Uh, this is a picture of Bond uh, holding two dead birds, uh, wearing a suit, a bow tie, a pipe and glasses. And it reminded me of Wally Cox in an episode from the Beverly Hillbillies back in the 60s called The Bird Watchers. And he and Miss Jane Hathaway were I think off on a birding adventure I don't think Granny was quite so sure. The real James Bond was actually quite handsome, uh, born in 1900 and lived to 1989. And uh, his wife, Mary, always claimed that he was more handsome than Sean Connery. But I think that was uh, a spouse, spouse's pride talking there. Uh, one thing you should know about Bond is he grew up uh, an amazing sort of a Horatio Alger in reverse uh, life. Uh, he was uh, born extremely rich. His mother uh, uh, on the left was a Roebling of the Brooklyn Bridge building Roeblings. That's Jim uh, right in the middle there and his son, uh, his brother Francis in the middle. Uh, Francis Sr. was a founding partner of E.B. Smith and Company. Uh, later became known as Smith Barney, which made money the old fashioned way. And they uh, had a townhouse in Center City, Philadelphia. And uh, since baseball season's opening tomorrow, uh, I thought I'd mention that uh, Bond was so rich, he was a part owner of the Philadelphia Phillies in 1903. And uh, things were going pretty well until uh, the Baker Bowl had wooden bleachers and they had too many fans in one place. The bleachers collapsed. I think 12 people died and uh, 60 or 70 were injured. And this was a, a big turning point and they stopped building wooden bleachers. Uh, Bond's father, afraid of being sued, immediately sold his interest in the team. 
but the fact that he was part owner of the Phillies gives you an idea of how much money he had. Uh, after that uh, tragedy, a tragedy hit the Bonds personally. This is uh, Jim Bond's older sister, Maggie, and she died at age seven of a ruptured appendix uh, in Maine. And uh, the father was so wealthy that he traveled by special train and yacht in time to see her around Mount Desert Island. This was actually in the newspapers. That's what a personality he, personality he was in Philadelphia. Perhaps to get over the tragedy, the Bonds moved uh, to Gwinnett Valley. And uh, this is a picture of the Bond estate as it looks today. Uh, it is currently the uh, administration building of Gwynedd Mercy University. And uh, the entire campus is the 300 acre estate. And it is an amazingly large house. Uh, back in those days, uh, Jim Bond never ate in the dining room with his parents. That was only for uh, the adults. The children were to be seen and not heard uh, in those days. A tragedy hit again. Uh, Jim Bond's mother died of cancer. Uh, his father remarried a widow from Britain and uh, carted Jim and his brother off to England where Jim Bond attended the Harrow School where he was teased for his American accent and uh, actually has his name carved into one of the walls at Harrow. After Harrow, he then went to Cambridge University studying finance. And uh, then when he got out of college, he tried to be a, a banker for a little while and hated it. And he was lucky enough that he had a small inheritance and he realized that if he didn't spend any of his money, just lived off the interest from his inheritance, uh, he could uh, quit his day job, basically work for the Academy of Natural Sciences as an ornithologist, full-time job without pay. And uh, this enabled him to go wherever he wanted, when he wanted, uh, but it, he also tended to dress like a bum and people didn't recognize him on the street because he was uh, so cheap with his money. That's Jim Bond on the right uh, at, at one of the bird trays at the Academy of Natural Sciences. That photo is actually hanging on the wall at the Academy. So pretty quickly, Bond decided his life's work would be the birds of the West Indies. And as you can see, that is a lot of water and a lot of islands. And uh, to get there, Bond traveled by boat and uh, it's worth mentioning that Bond got terribly seasick whenever he traveled by boat. So he's traveling down there and then he's traveling island to island uh, by banana boat, sloop. He was on a rum runner once, you name it. However he could get from island to island, even though he was seasick, uh, he got there. Uh, and when he got there, he traveled on foot or on horseback. And I tend to think of these uh, old ornithological expeditions as a bunch of rich guys and uh, their porters and uh, a big entourage having fancy dinners and big tents. Actually, Jim Bond lived with the locals, uh, ate what they ate, which was often rodents. Uh, this is the Zapata Swamp where Jim Bond stayed for a couple of months and uh, actually lived in a charcoal burner's hut down there. The tools of Bond's trade, uh, this is his pocket knife. And if you look closely on the spay blade, it says for flesh only, which sounds like a great name for an Ian Fleming novel. Uh, he used arsenic as a preservative and he did uh, use a double barreled shotgun with bird shot. Uh, after 10 years of traveling from island to island, uh, Bond came out with a book called Birds of the West Indies. And if you are a birder and have traveled to the Caribbean, you probably have heard of this book. Uh, it was published by the Academy of Natural Sciences in 1936. And uh, he did try to have a Philadelphia publisher named Joseph Lippincott and company publish it. But Joe Lippincott said, sorry, this is something for the museums, not for a publisher. Turns out that, uh, Joe Lippincott was wrong. Uh, the book in its very edition stayed in print for more than six decades. Basically two thirds of the 20th century 
you're going to the West Indies and you love birds, you're going to own a book by James Bond. Turns out that uh, one of the people who was uh, attracted to the birds of the West Indies by James Bond was a gentleman named Ian Fleming. And this is an interview with Fleming by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Mr. Fleming, how does an author tackle the problem of selecting a name for the hero of his stories? Well, it isn't only the hero. I mean, I generally pick up names just driving through the countryside, uh, through villages and so on. You see an interesting name. Uh, over a tobacconist or chemist or something of that sort in any country in the world. But um, when I started to write these books in 1952, I wanted to find um, a name which wouldn't have any of this romantic uh, overtones like Peregrine Carruthers or whatever it might be. I wanted a really flat, quiet name. And one of my Bibles out here is uh, James Bond's Birds of the West Indies, which is a very famous uh, ornithological book indeed. And I thought, well, now, James Bond, now, that's a pretty quiet name. And so I simply stole it and used it. The trouble was, uh, although Fleming stole Bond's name, he never told Jim Bond or his wife that uh, he had used James Bond for this 007 hero. And uh, Nothing really came of it until the early 1960s when uh, John Kennedy became president, announced that one of his favorite books was From Russia with Love, and Dr. No was coming out. And Bond and his wife, Mary, started getting late night calls from breathless young women going, hello, could I speak to James, please? And Bond and his wife are going, what? Why are we getting these prank calls? So uh, a friend said, hey, I just read an interview with Ian Fleming in a men's magazine, and he says he named uh, 007 after your husband. And uh, Mary Bond was sort of taken aback at first and then sort of got into it. And uh, she wrote to Ian Fleming, accusing him of identity theft and uh, stealing some ideas from her husband's books. And uh, Fleming wrote back apologetic and uh, said, I'm so sorry if you're ever in Jamaica, please stop by and say hello. And of course, Mary Bond, uh, she was a great writer in her own regard, but she loved this 007 connection. And she and Jim Bond show up at Goldeneye, uh, Ian Fleming's uh, bungalow in Jamaica, show up unannounced and uh, say, hello, I'm Jim Bond, I'm James Bond. And of course, uh, Fleming's jaw drops at first and his first words were, you're not here to sue me, are you? And uh, Jim Bond said, no, I'm not here to sue you. I, I really don't even like your books very much. So uh, Fleming said, well, that's perf perfectly understandable. Uh, come on in and have a drink. So they had a, a great day together, had lunch, went swimming. And at the end of the day, Ian Fleming uh, got out his new book, uh, you only live twice and signed it to the real James Bond from the thief of his identity. Ian Fleming, February 5th, 1964, a great day. So just as Ian Fleming uh, stole Jim Bond's name, I stole the title of the book from Ian Fleming's inscription here. Uh, at first, the 007 connection wasn't too terrible for Jim Bond because it was sort of fun, but after a while, the shaken not stirred and all the other James Bond jokes, the womanizing and the guns really got to Jim Bond. I think it really hit home when in 1967, he discovered the, the last Eskimo curlew uh, known to man. It was extinct at that point. And turns out a, a hunter in Barbados had shot one and although it was supposed to be extinct and ended up in a local market where an ornithologist found it, saved it for James Bond. Bond shows up six months later and says, this is, this is an Eskimo curlew. They're supposed to be extinct. So he wrote a paper on it. It made a splash. It was big news. There was still an Eskimo curlew alive until that hunter killed it. Uh, and so Bond uh, made the announcement and he expected the news to be in 
Scientific American and ornithological journals, maybe, you know, Audubon magazine. And uh, much to his surprise, uh, newspapers around the country. Uh, uh, this was big news solely because James Bond's name was the same as 007's. He, he was pretty much anonymous, uh, wonderful author and popular, but anonymous until his 007 connection came along. And headline writers wrote every predictable headline you can imagine. His name is James Bond, and this one's for the birds, on and on. You get the idea, hundreds of newspapers. Uh, turns out that the, that 007 ornithology connection really didn't take hold, though, until 2002, when Pierce Brosnan starred in Die Another Day. And that's Pierce Brosnan walking into a hotel in Havana, holding his copy of Birds of the West Indies. Uh, and these, they've crossed off the name, so you can't see that uh, Pierce himself had written it. Um, this is uh, probably the really famous scene from the book. Uh, one thing off the bat, it's very strange to see a guy uh, watching birds smoking a cigar through binoculars. So here's the scene. Magnificent view. It is, isn't it? Too bad it's lost on everybody else. Mojito? You should try it. Jacinta Johnson. My friends call me Jinx. My friends call me James Bond. Jinx, you say? Born on Friday the 13th. You believe in bad luck? Let's just say my relationships don't seem to last. Hmm. I know the feeling. The predators usually appear at sunset. And why is that? It's when their prey comes out to drink. Too strong for you? I can learn to like it, if I have the time. How much time have you got? Until dawn. What about you? Oh, I'm just here for the birds. Hmm. Ornithologist. A uh, little known fact, uh, that script won an Oscar for cheesiest dialogue. Uh, getting lost in all the Bond uh, hoopla was Jim Bond, the conservationist. And uh, a lot of the concerns that Bond wrote about in that very first Birds of the West Indies in 1936 were ahead of their time. He talked about the problem of cutting down forests for plantations, he talked about uh, the wanton killing of birds by local hunters, the illicit trade in rare parrots, and he wrote about the need to create national parks where no hunting of any kind was allowed. Uh, he wrote that there can be no doubt that the principal factor that has resulted in the extinction or rarity of so many West Indian birds is man. And for his 1947 edition, he actually uh, put an ivory-billed woodpecker illustration on the back cover. And I think this might be the only field guide that has a picture of a near extinct bird uh, right on the cover, since you are supposed to be looking at uh, pictures of birds you're gonna see. Uh, Bond would be heartened to know that the Nature Conservancy has been addressing environmental issues all over the Caribbean for decades. And uh, speaking of Cuba, where uh, Pierce Brosnan was smoking a cigar and looking through binoculars, I'd like to bring in Marcy Eggers of the Nature Conservancy to talk about what's going on in Cuba and elsewhere in the Caribbean for the Nature Conservancy. Marcy. Great, thank you. As, as Jim mentioned, the ornithologist, Dr. James Bond, spent significant time in Cuba, which isn't surprising. Of the more than 700 species of birds recorded across the Caribbean, more than half of them have been documented in Cuba. 
So this island has nearly 100 endemic species and subspecies, a few of which are seen here in photos from a trip I took to Cuba's Zapata Swamp in 2019. Zapata harbors the world's smallest bird, the bee hummingbird that you see here, which is only a tiny two and a half inches long. It's important to also mention that 70% of the bird species documented in Cuba are migratory. And the case is similar for other Caribbean islands that provide winter habitats or stopover points for North American migratory birds. So protecting these birds' Caribbean habitats is just as important as protecting their habitats here in our own backyards for those of us who live in North America. Next slide, please. I'm proud to say that the Nature Conservancy has been engaged in conservation in Cuba for more than 20 years. We've supported the efforts of Cuban scientists with exchanges and by sharing technology and expertise. And in late 2019, we signed our first ever partnership agreement with a Cuban organization, the Antonio Nunez Jimenez Foundation. We're pictured with some of their staff in Havana in this photo and are working with them on activities like coral protection and restoration. I'll pass it back over to you, Jim. Uh, so one of the things the Nature Conservancy does is protect coral reefs and fish. And uh, it turns out that this has a real James Bond connection as well. Uh, when Bond was down in the Caribbean, he collected all sorts of things, not just birds. He collected uh, uh, insects and hundreds and hundreds of fish for science. And if I, I reread some of the, the Ian Fleming novels about 007, and in the novels and short stories, a lot of the fish that Ian Fleming mentions, Jim Bond collected in the Caribbean decades before uh, Fleming ever set foot there. Uh, little known fact, uh, just as the real James Bond dabbled in marine biology, so did 007. A marine biologist is never on holiday. That's right, a marine biologist is never on holiday. I think we all know that to be true. Uh, this is a scene from The Spy Who Loved Me. Uh, this is, uh, the aquarium of the arch villain and appears to have a human hand <laughs> at the bottom of the tank. So I don't think it's ever really explained, but uh, this is a, a scene from The Spy Who Loved Me. Why do we seek to conquer space when seven tenths of our universe remains to be explored? The world beneath the sea. We have to repair that oversight, Mr. Stromberg. My name is Sterling, Robert Sterling. Uh, that just, I don't know why it cracks me up every time I see it. Uh, so one of, the, one of the dozens of fish that Jim Bond collected in the Caribbean was the parrotfish. And most of these birds are actually, uh, most of these birds, most of these fish are in the collection of the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia today. But I, I thought Marcy had an interesting take on uh, the parrotfish that Bond collected and is very popular in the Caribbean. Sure. So what a lot of people don't know is that the beautiful iconic white beaches in the Caribbean are made in part by fish poop. Yes, that's right, fish excrement. So these beautiful, brilliantly colored parrotfish play an important role in the coral ecosystem by eating algae off coral reefs so that the corals don't suffocate. And if you go to the next slide, please, Jim. So what basically comes out of them contributes to the Caribbean sandy white beaches like this one in the Grenadines. So the next time you visit the Carib Caribbean beach and stick your toes in the sand, you can think about this and think the coral reefs and parrotfish. Unfortunately, parrotfish populations have been at risk due to overfishing. So the Nature Conservancy developed a campaign that we've promoted in several Caribbean countries to encourage consumers to pass on parrotfish. And we'll show you a promotional video of this campaign here, which you'll see on the next slide. Coral reefs protect our coastlines and provide food and shelter for our Caribbean fisheries. But our reefs are in decline and they need our help. Did you know that the beautiful parrotfish keep our reefs clean and healthy? They eat algae that grows on the reefs and are food for other fish we like to eat. 
But when we catch and eat too many parrotfish, the algae grows unchecked, causing the reefs to suffocate and die. Some islands have realized the importance of parrotfish and have banned the catching of them. You can help too by not buying parrotfish from the market or the restaurant. Ask about the fish before you order. Pass on parrotfish to keep them on the reefs and off our plates. Coral reefs need parrotfish and we need our coral reefs to maintain our Caribbean way of life. Pass on parrotfish so that we can leave a healthy coral reef to our next generation. I think James Bond would have been thrilled to see that video. Uh, the other thing that uh, Bond predicted, unfortunately, was uh, all these low-lying islands in, in the Caribbean, especially the Bahamas, are very vulnerable to hurricanes. And uh, one of the, the birds Bond actually discovered, is Bahama nuthatch. Uh, Bond thought it was a subspecies of the nuthatch in the Southeast United States, and uh, he treated it as such. But in recent years, uh, with DNA and this sort of thing, and some of the birds that Bond collected, they, they realized the Bahama nuthatch is a different species. So that was the good news. The bad news is the past couple of hurricanes down in the Bahamas have probably made it extinct. So by the time this bird becomes an official species all of its own, it probably uh, will no longer exist. So that was something Bond talked about uh, in the first edition of Birds of the West Indies. He said, hurricanes often take heavy toll of bird life being particularly destructive on the low lying Bahama Islands. Although it is surprising that the havoc caused by these storms is not greater and uh, I guess uh, his prediction turned out to be true. The havoc has been much greater in recent years. Uh, Marcy, do you wanna? Sure, so this is an aerial drone image of the community of Subiz, Grenada. And it, this shows the vulnerability of many coastal communities who live literally on the water's edge in the region. Just in the past few years, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the devastating category five hurricanes like Maria and Irma in 2017 and Hurricane Dorian in 2019, which have not only had catastrophic impacts on people of multiple countries throughout the region, but impacted vulnerable bird populations as well. While the Nature Conservancy has many fantastic local partner organizations working directly with threatened bird species, we are focusing on broader marine and coastal habitat protection and have a special focus on restoring habitats like coral reefs and mangroves, which are vitally important for hurricane protection. For instance, healthy coral reefs act as a barrier from storms and reduce the impacts of waves by as much as 97%. Healthy mangrove forests reduce wave height by nearly 70% and thus ease erosion and flood risk. If you can go to the next slide, please, Jim. As such, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the importance of the coastal mangrove forests. Not only do they provide what we call green infrastructure to protect human communities, but they also play a vital role in providing habitat for birds as well. For instance, some birds found in the Caribbean, such as the, the wood stork and the aptly named mangrove cuckoo can nest almost exclusively in mangroves. And the complex underwater root systems of mangroves also serve as nurseries for baby fish and other small fish. These fish in turn are important source of food for multiple bird species. Next slide. So since 2014, the Nature Conservancy has planted more than 800,000 mangroves in degraded coastal areas in the Caribbean. Some of these efforts have been in close collaboration with the Red Cross as part of a global partnership with them, given both the conservation and humanitarian importance of building coastal resilience. So the photo on the left here is of kids planting mangroves in that community in Grenada that I showed a moment ago. And on the right, a couple of masked boobies are hanging out in some mangroves on Jamaica's southern coast. 
And this is something that personally gives me a lot of hope as what's good for the birds is also very good for people. That's what the Nature Conservancy is really trying to achieve in the Caribbean in implementing conservation efforts in which both people and nature can thrive. Uh, thanks so much, Jim. I'll uh, appreciate your support for this important work and uh, pass it back over to you. Great. So when we started today, we were asked who was James Bond named after? Uh, Turns out he may have been named after a real life spy, as you can read in the book, but I think most people are picking C, an ornithologist, and I hope you did as well. So I'd like to thank all of you uh, for coming today and for the Nature Conservancy and uh, Montclair Film for doing a great job in hosting this event. And uh, if you want to read, read more about my book, uh, realjamesbond.net, uh, go to that website and uh, any proceeds from the book sales will go to the Nature Conservancy's Caribbean effort. Uh, also, for more information on the Nature Conservancy in the Caribbean, go to nature.org Caribbean. So I am going to stop sharing my screen and throw it open to questions. And uh, once again, thank you all for listening. Thank you, Jim, very much, uh, and Marcy, very much. So it was a great presentation. We've got several questions in the Q&A, so I'll start off. Uh, Lillian would like to know, Jim, how you got interested in the real James Bond. Uh, what drew you to him and uh, to telling this story? Well, I write a birding column for the Bergen Record in New Jersey, and I needed a subject for a column and I saw that uh, James Bond was an ornithologist and I looked up and he was from Philadelphia. And uh, I said, I don't think I can write about this because there's no New Jersey angle. And so I kept looking and looking until I found an, a New Jersey angle. And by that time, I'd become fascinated by this guy, James Bond, and realized he's much more than a little footnote or a clue in a crossword puzzle. And that really got me hooked. And how long did you work researching him for the for this book and uh, in terms of putting it all together? Uh, I'd say it was about three and a half years. And I, one of the great things about it was I got to go to Philadelphia, Mount Desert Island, Cuba, uh, Jamaica twice, uh, the Bahamas with the Nature Conservancy, and I actually saw coral reefs with them down there. So it was just a great experience. Uh, the, having the book come out was sort of a bonus at the end of the, end of the trip. <laughs> Did you get to follow his path and sort of his process? Is that sort of the effort that you were taking? His footsteps and, you know, I was at Goldeneye a couple times and uh, saw some of the birds that uh, Ian Fleming wrote about. Uh, it was it was a pretty cool experience all in all. Amazing. Uh, Dorothea wants to know uh, who did the illustrations for the book, for James's book, I think. Uh, Earl Poole. A noted ornithological illustrator. Um, JD was wondering if James or anyone ever found a live example of a bird they thought to be extinct when they were writing uh, Birds of the West Indies. Uh, I, I, I think the Bahama parrot was considered to be extinct, uh, certainly by the ornithologists in the Bahamas. And uh, James Bond uh, bummed a ride on a rum runner, dropped him off at this uh, ex obscure part of an island, and he woke up the next morning and here were all these Bahama parrots. And uh, on his way back to the Bahamas, he stopped by the ornithologist's uh, house, the guy who told him the birds were extinct. The guy was at home, so he just left a parrot feather of the extinct bird telling him, maybe you're wrong here. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Ken wanted to know if you wrote only exclusively about birds of the West Indies or were there other birds uh, and other uh, habitats that he uh, ended up writing about as an ornithologist? Uh, well, my favorite is the birds of Mount Desert Island. He wrote with his uncle and it was an extraordinary field guide in that his description of uh, the American crow, for example, was described as uh, the locals call it soup meat. You know, you don't usually hear uh, birds described as meals in, in field guides. And he also wrote about the birds of Bolivia. And what about his, um, you mentioned his interest in the nautical species as well. Was, did the published work on that 
uh, with the fish and or was that more of a, a conservation interest? That was more of an assignment. When he was down there, he had a, said, if you're ever, here's how to pick up, here's how to collect fish. And I have a PDF of like a 30 page instruction sheet on how to get fish down there. And uh, he, he was, you know, when he started out, he was a maniacal conservationist and he collected everything. I mean, they have, there are like stink bugs and crickets, you name it, named after the real James Bond because of all the work he did. That's great. Here's a question for you, Marcy, uh, from Judy. She'd like to know how someone like her who doesn't work in the environmental field can help uh, protect Caribbean migratory birds. Another, right, that's a great uh, question. Life. So as I mentioned, uh, helping uh, Caribbean migratory birds, it, it, it starts in our own backyards, especially for those of us based in the US. This is an exciting time of year that migratory birds that have been wintering in the Caribbean are starting to come back our way. And what I would recommend is plant native plants in your backyard. You know, they're coming back hungry and they've been flying thousands of miles and they want food that they're, they're, accustomed, they're, they're, they're accustomed to eating. And uh, be, be careful of the chemicals you put in your yard so they can be healthy as they're, they're starting their, you know, building their nests. Um, you can do things like support the US uh, Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which is super important in helping protect, uh, helping protect birds. Keep your cats inside. Cats are number one killer of migratory songbirds. And uh, you support organizations like the Nature Conservancy that are working hard to protect their habitats, both, both here in North America as well as um, in the Caribbean. Marcy, another question for you from Bonnie um, about the impact of development on conservation in the Caribbean. You know, a lot of the Caribbean nations economically are, are poor and see development, industrial development and real estate development as a, you know, a sort of cash and taxation uh, benefit to the governments there. So there's a lot of overdevelopment. Um, what impact has that had on the environment and on conservation? Sure. So certainly development in the Caribbean, like anywhere in the world, is, is, has, has had tremendous impacts on the reduction of, of natural habitats for birds. And so that's, that is something that as we look at, you know, creating, uh, you know, protecting coastal areas, marine areas is, is, especially, um, is, is especially important. And that's one thing that the Nature Conservancy has been very involved with. And basically, we have what we call the Caribbean challenge initiative to basically triple the, the protection of um, uh, protected areas in the region. Um, so that so the birds and as well as marine life have uh, the habitats that they're uh, that, that, that they need and in, in order in order to survive. And how, how is it working with the governments down there in terms of your work? Well, governments have been strong partners with this. And, you know, they're the ones at the end of the day that have to declare the, the protected areas. And so, you know, they, the tourism industry, everybody is recognizing that, uh, you know, as I mentioned, with the, with, with the coral reefs and the parrotfish and the parrotfish create those iconic white beaches that attract people to the region. So if we're protecting our reefs, we're protecting what is important for, um, for the economies of these countries. Great. Uh, Jim, a question for you. What other topics have you, or, or personalities have you covered in your, in your writing? Uh, that we could find online or go explore now that we know about this book. Oh, thanks. I've written about the New Jersey Meadowlands, uh, Hawk Mountain. Uh, there's a nature preserve in my backyard called the Celery Farm I've written about, and uh, Jungle of the Maya, uh, about the largest rainforest in Central America. And are those available at your, web at your website as well? Uh, probably are on Amazon as well. And uh, one other, one other fun fact, and there's no such thing as a fun fact, but uh, this is my third biography of a Philadelphian, little known fact. Uh, my first book was about Mike Schmidt, the baseball player. And I also wrote about Bobby Clark, the hockey player. And they're probably better known in Philadelphia than the real James Bond, but I'm used to it. And then a, a final question here from JD. Uh, I guess for both of you, but primarily to Jim, uh, if you were to make a movie about the real James Bond instead of the spy James Bond, who would you cast to play James Bond, the uh, the ornithologist? I, have a thought. Uh, I think Robert Pattinson would be a good choice. 
<laughs> he's a good choice for everything. Yes, exactly. <laughs> he's had a lot of tickets. Marcy, do you have any thoughts on who'd like to see? I'll play second Robert well? Pattinson. That sounds okay. like a great suggestion. I was gonna go for late. I was gonna go for uh, Steve Buscemi for the later uh, era of James Bond with the glasses and you know the suit. He could pull that off. He's a great. Ouch. Actor. Ouch. Oh, that's not bad. Steve's great. <laughs> <laughs> One of our finest actors. Yes, um, he is. Absolutely. Exactly. Great. Um, okay. Well, those are all of the questions that we had. I want to thank you guys so much uh, for bringing this program to us. Uh, at Montclair Film and the Nature Conservancy. We're so grateful for your time. And thank you to all the participants who came and asked questions and watched the presentation today. We really, really appreciate it. Um, I hope everyone is well and staying safe. And uh, again, just really, really grateful to both of you, Jim and Marcy, for your presentation. Great, thank you. It was, it was a blast. I had a great time. Thank you, Montclair Film and Nature Conservancy. Thank you. Thank you all.